What it do, what it do. This is the Brothers on Books podcast, where we find great books that will give you real value and actionable steps and have fun in the process. Please reach out to us at brothersonbooks at gmail.com for any book recommendations, or if you would like to be a guest host for a particular book you have in mind. A great review or rating on whichever platform you're listening to this would be greatly appreciated. And lastly, if you can think of any friend, family member, or coworker that might like this episode, please pass it along. I am Jack Allwile, and with me, as always, is my brother, Alex Allwile. Al, how are you doing today? Doing pretty well, Jack. How about yourself? You know, it's uh, another nice Sunday in Charlotte, and yeah, I'm ready to discuss this book. Uh, today, we are discussing Marin Katusa's The Rise of America, and that's the remaking of the world order. And uh, yeah, you got any info on Marin Katusa? Uh, so Katusa, he's based out of Vancouver. Uh, I believe, I believe a son to immigrant parents from, I believe, the Czech Republic. I, I may be Croatia. Wrong yeah, Croatia. Croatia. Sorry. Yeah, Croatia. Yeah. Uh, he actually started off as a calculus teacher. Uh, and that's pretty apparent from some of the analysis he does in the book on valuations. Uh, he's the head of Katusa Research. Uh, he has a net billion of roughly $1 billion. I don't know what, uh, how much he has under management, but they focus for most part on sort of the resource sector. Uh, and he, he does a very good job. I've read some of his material now of explaining the resource sector and talking about how he finds value in investments. Cool. So I guess with that said, Jack, what was uh, what were your thoughts after finishing the book? Um, I've he- I've heard him speak on a lot of podcasts before. Like you, you can go hear him on the Investors Podcast. He's been on there a couple times, and most recently on Rich Dad Radio, I think he did the best job explaining his carbon credit, uh, like philosophy and just the background. I think what I'll be taking away from this is, uh, well, one, to look into carbon credits. And also, he just brings up a lot of new technology that's on the horizon in terms of energy and just very interesting ideas that I never thought of or had heard of. And I'll, I'll definitely be looking more into some of these. Uh, what about you? Yeah, so I, I picked this book in our book draft, and sort of like you said, I heard uh, I heard Katusa first talk on the Rich Dad podcast, where I guess he was kind of on almost like his book tour, so to say, mm-hmm. where him and Kiyosaki were kind of talking about the book a lot. Uh, yeah, he does the the points he brings up about the energy sector sector and really elements in general. I find very interesting, uh, and. And I guess in this book, yeah, I feel like he does a good job of highlighting really how uh, our monetary system, sort of the history of the monetary system, not so much the history um, per se, but how our monetary system currently works and what we're going towards. And I just found it really interesting. Now, did you, you read all of the appendices, didn't you? I, I did, yeah. And the appendices were, I thought, very good. So he, he goes much more into the just the general history of money in the appendix. Yeah, I will, I thought was a, I, was I will a, say I did not read the appendices, but they, they look very good. And I do plan on reading them, but just ran out of time. But it, yeah, it seems actually, like they're very good. In, in, in the appendix, he actually highlights how he values uh, what he looks for when he's picking uh, investments. And he cool. essentially gives his, his strategies, which I thought were, were quite interesting. Uh, so I think with that said, we'll do our first ad of the day, pickleball, the greatest sport you've never heard of. Pickleball is the fastest growing leisure sport in the United States, a mix between tennis and table tennis. However, don't let the average age of participants in this sport fool you. This game has fierce competition and only the will of a champion can thrive. Go buy some paddles and balls and play pickleball. The greatest sport you've never heard of. I guess with that said, I, I actually just played in a very, I played in a very small tournament this morning. 
on uh, i came away with the hardware so that's good very nice uh, yeah and for all of you that are listening currently the national championships are taking place right now not that most people care but like at this very, moment yeah i mean the tournaments are going the tournament is going on right now sunday wow. the, w- the way these professional tournaments work is well if you remember back from when we played uh, we played the entire tournament for our division on one day. So what they've been doing is they have the tournament go usually Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So you have some combination of singles, gender, and mixed. And then you have all of the finals. So the champ- it's referred to as championship Sunday. So all of the finals from those brackets are played out on Sunday. Hmm. Makes it kind of, you know, makes it kind of Sunday fun to watch. Cool. So I guess with that said, you know, let's let's get into it. So the first uh, sort of the first topic that we had listed to talk about was uh, Jack. You want to maybe uh, you, a, uh, you, you you cut out there a little bit. I, w- I was saying our first topic of discussion is MMT versus FMC, and maybe we could give a definition and maybe a breakdown of what those are and what those mean. Sure. So FMC is fiscal monetary coordination, and then MMT is modern monetary theory. Um, well, f- fiscal monetary coordination is basically when the government and the Fed are coordinating. So f- fiscal is in terms of, in reference to the government, monetary would be more like our central bank or the Fed. And I, I think he kind of says that, I mean, the, the, the Fed is supposed to be independent, independent. Right. and it's supposed to yeah, act in the best interest of, I guess, the people and, yeah, be independent. But basically in FMC, and I, th- does he say we're actually there already? Or, I mean, it, it seems like we are kind of, I mean. In, in FMC or an MMT? Because a- a- FMC. Like he, he is saying that we are in FMC. And yeah. that, I mean, in the, what I took away from this was that we are currently in FMC, and at least that's what it seems like to me, that the Fed and the government clearly coordinate together, right? Uh, yeah. And, and you have, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, Yellen is, isn't she the Secretary of State or something now? She's the Treasury, I think, Treasury, but she used yeah. to be the Fed chair. Fed chairman, right. And, and that's, that's kind of... I mean, Ki- yeah. Kiyosaki always complains about that, essentially just sort of saying that we now have central planners. Uh, but I, I I sort of got the Katusa thought we were, at least if we weren't by definition in MMT, we were going there very quickly. Uh, I mean, this MMT idea to me, I mean, I've heard this in the past and it just sounds like nuts to me. Like, because basically debt as we know it, like will not matter at all. And that they're basically saying, but like, you know, a normal household, you know, you make money and then you budget to stay within what you make, I guess. And it kind of needs to balance, <laughs> but right. in MM, MMT, it's kind of like the reverse way. Like you spend and it doesn't really matter how much you spend. And then like you, you tax kind of on the back end to kind of just offset and keep people kind of honest and try to prevent inflation, I guess. It it, it seems kind of just communistic to me. <laughs> well, the, the the MMT in my, from what I got was that the debt only doesn't matter to the government. It just gives the government free range to spend money on literally whatever they want, right? Yeah. And he, he actually made the point because whenever I had heard that, the first thing I always thought was, well, if they're just going to print money and they can spend money, you know, however they feel, like, what is the point of taxes? Yeah. And what's the, what, why, why does anyone want to work when they can just print the money? Like, why, right. like what's yeah, the, <laughs> what's the point of anything? Yeah. yeah. It, it seems like a huge incentive not to work. Yeah. Uh, at least how I view it. But, but he, he did bring up 
in terms of like fiscal monetary coordination, how that's worked in the past, I guess, like during World War II, that there was a lot of coordination. And that's kind of how a lot of these things got built and uh, the, the infrastructure and the materials to help with the war uh, were, were processed through, I guess, this, this fiscal monetary coordination. So I, I sort of thought what was interesting was he brings up the point that in times of war, uh, when you have, I guess, what would be referred to as a, I mean, I guess the way I would think of it is a fiscally responsible uh, monetary system, like some, something that would be, I mean, if you had fiat where it was truly balanced, so your, you know, your income was balanced by your spending, or if you actually had something backed by a true, a true good, like a gold standard, was that in times of war, your, your spending always outstrips uh, what you can truly spend if you're, uh, if you're tied to something. So you always have to go into debt. And it seems like in these war times, that's when we've really pushed the debt ceiling limits, or I guess in modern day terms, these financial collapses, uh, which really lends credit to trying these new sort of uh, theories. But I I've always thought that if every American has to you know, live within their means, at least to some extent, that the government should also have to do that as well. Uh, but that does not appear to be the case. I, I don't know, Jack. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess he his his thesis a lot is that the U.S. has built up all this goodwill over these decades, and it sounds to me like he's saying it's just because we stayed on the gold standard the longest. I guess or we, we were kind of the most responsible for the longest, but then in 71, we, I guess, nixed that. Um, and because we kind of became the bank for the world, now we can kind of do whatever we want and no one's going to fight back on us and we can kind of, yeah, do what we want. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't actually know if this was in the appendix or in the book, but he, he brings up, he brings up the petrodollar. Uh-huh. And he, I mean, he's a big, he's a big energy guy. And, and he brought up the fact that when Nixon, Nixon takes the dollar off of gold, they immediately struck a deal with Saudi Arabia. I think it was uh, Nixon. And uh, I think the guy's name was Kissinger, where we as a country offered protection to Saudi Arabia from, I think Iran, Iraq and Russia in exchange for requiring Saudi Arabia. All they had to do was only accept dollars for oil. oil, which okay. caused, you know, since everyone at that time still needed oil, it still required the entire world to use dollars. And I think that's part of the reason the entire world is reliant, at least has become reliant on dollars, is because they always needed dollars for so long to get their energy. Uh, and I think that is sort of built up a huge demand of dollars. And yeah, now, now I feel like we can kind of abuse that by essentially printing dollars and then using those essentially fake dollars to buy real goods. Uh, and he, he also brings up this idea of the, a swap line, basically a line of credit that the U.S. can offer to these other countries. And if from my understanding, I, I forget. I have it written down somewhere. I think there's eight or I don't remember how many countries have a U.S. swap line. But basically, if you don't play by the U.S.'s rules, you might not get a swap line. So if you need access to dollars, you might not have them. OK, I found it is 14 countries have a U.S. swap line and 85, I guess, have applied. Um, and and he, he kind of brought up the, the fact that India does not have a swap line, but I, I think they they want to, to have access to dollars. And he, he's kind of implying that that's uh, the reason China and India are, are having so many issues right now, because in, India wants to appear to be a US ally to get a swap line so they can have access to dollars. Um, but yeah, the, the, the swap line stuff I hadn't really thought of. I mean, I've heard him speak on that or uh, and other people speak on that, but I, I, I guess I didn't. It, it's yeah, it's hard to visualize like 
why or yeah it's just because i guess so many countries have debt in dollars and they, they need dollars to pay their debts so he, he goes into it more when he's talking about his investment strategy he, he is to an extent says that when he's looking at i mean he's looking at mining uh resources out of the ground like one of his number one things is being in a country that has a U.S. swap line. Yep. And that's, that's sort of so the government, well, it says one of, it says a couple of things. Well, first, if you're, if you have a U.S. swap line, that sort of says that you have somewhat of a stable government and that the country won't just come in and take your mine and steal your stuff. Sort of a la like Robert Kiyosaki in, when he talks about his gold mine in China, Mm -hmm. where after he invested all this money, the, the Chinese government just came and stole his gold mine. Yeah. And he had, I think, a silver mine taken over in Argentina at one point, yeah. too. Uh, I, I, that sounds familiar, but I'm not. I, I believe that is correct. But yeah. that, that was one of the key factors. And he said a lot of people sort of downplay going into these, I guess, minus swap line countries that have potentially more, more lucrative mines but you run this huge geopolitical risk of having just everything taken from you. Yeah. He, he, I, I've heard him speak a lot on how you'll see analysts grade these mines. And, and like when you're, so let's say you're doing a projection with like cash flows into the future. Typically the, the riskier the project, the higher you would want to discount the future cash flows. So, so like the present value would be lower. Like, so if, if you're doing a mine in Nevada versus a mine in like Nigeria or, or um, Somalia, like you would want to discount those things in the more unstable countries higher. Um, so you would really need like a super high return um, to even try to go into those projects. And yeah, and he's saying he likes, but but he's saying a lot of the analysts are discounting a lot of these projects the same, like whether it's in like, yeah, Somalia or like Nevada. And right. like they shouldn't be discounting at the same rate. Right. It should be way, you know, the, the return for being in Somalia needs to be way, way higher than being in Nevada because yeah. some of the Somalese government may just decide to steal what you've developed. And yeah. he then calls that the, I believe he also refers to that as the AK-47 rule, <laughs> yeah. which is if you see, if you just see a lot of people on the streets carrying AK-47s, you probably don't want to be there, yeah. uh, which, you know, I think is probably a safe rule. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think we, we sort of got off a little bit of, of talk. It's okay. our, our, other, our other talking point was the, you know, the goals of the central bank uh, sort of want to go into, go into that a little bit. I think sure. Sure. To explain it a little bit better um, than me. Well, I guess they, they, they want to control the interest rates, ensure liquidity. Um, I mean, it says they, they, they focus is kind of twofold, create inflation and prevent deflation and create maximum employment. And I, I mean, the I think the Fed has recently said they they kind of maybe acknowledge like the inflation stuff, but they're kind of focusing on maximizing employment. And the Fed they they, they have two primary tools they can use to alter behavior, I guess. And well, one is the interest rates, and then the other is creating money. Um. I don't know. I don't know if you have anything to, to add on that, but, but the, yeah, yeah I mean, so. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say that they, they kind of just want to create a general trust for the currency. Um, right. That's yeah. I, I just, I guess I've always, I mean, I guess in, in reference to inflation versus deflation, uh, everyone seems to hate deflation, but you know, when I when I personally think about it, uh, it sounds like if you think about it, I think ideally you as a 
person would want deflation. Like if, you know, if you have a hundred dollars today and you can with a hundred dollars buy a hundred hamburgers. And if in a year your hundred dollars could buy 200 hamburgers, I think everyone would be happy. That would be good. That would, right. Your, your purchasing power increases. So your quality of life, you know, should also increase your money is becoming more valuable, but there seems to be this huge push to never have deflation. Uh, and I guess there, I guess just to sort of touch base on it from a government standpoint, there are two reasons that I usually go back to as to why that is uh, one. So the government can take out more debt, right. And it makes it easier to pay off that debt. And two, in, uh, in real terms, they're able to get a, they're able to tax more, uh, you bring in more in taxes relative to the purchasing power. So uh, you're able to bring in more money through taxes that are then able to buy more stuff. Uh, I guess, am I, am I missing one or is that, is that I mean, for the most I, part accurate? I don't know. I get, I, yeah, I get confused every time I think about this too. I mean, yeah, I mean, you would want deflation if you're a saver, Um because yeah, your dollar's worth more tomorrow than it is today. But in a system where, yeah, we do have a lot of debt, it, it makes sense to be in an inflationary environment. So your debt gets, you know, felt sifted right. away, I guess. Right. But uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is that inflation, I think, causes people. It, I think it causes people to take more risks than they probably want to. Like, Right. When I hear when I hear people talk about and I think we've talked about this before, when I hear people talk and promote MMT or things like this, all I want to do is I want to, you know, leverage my house up. I want to take out as much debt as possible and buy more real assets, primarily houses. Like that's sort of my goal. Yeah. Just because I know that if they keep printing money, it's going to become easier and easier to pay that debt off. Yep. So I mean that's but, yeah, that's the only yeah, I mean, we we just bought a lot of, I mean, I, I just got some real estate and yeah, it's mostly just because of concerns about inflation, I would say. Right. But that's, that's a lot more work than just putting all my money in a bank and assuming that in a year I'll be able to buy more money with it or buy more goods with it. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of lazy. I, I would rather just have my money become more valuable over time without me having to do anything instead of sort of doing work. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the big case for, you know, all these yeah, gold, real estate, Bitcoin, um, these real sort of values to combat this debasement of the currency. Um, also, well, what was, is it Booth that the guy that wrote, um, yeah, what Jeff was that Booth. book called Jeff Booth? Price yeah. of Tomorrow. Price of yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. That was a great book. Um, I mean, the, the other thing is when you're in an inflationary environment, usually the people closest to the top also benefit because they get access to the money. So the, the money that's printed, they get access to the money first. So you get free money. And then you get to use it in today, like with the purchasing power of today. But by the time it usually trickles down, uh, usually the the cost of goods and services goes up faster than the cost of wages. So the people that really get hurt would be sort of your normal workers. And in many regards, this is this I think is probably the main the main driver of in like the inequality, like the income inequality of the country is that people that are able to have investments, they see the inflation of their investments while people that live paycheck to paycheck just see their meager amount of money that they make in a paycheck sort of evaporate away in buying power. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Did I, did I miss anything there, Jeff? No, no. No. Okay. Uh, I guess with that, we'll sort of move on to our, our next topic we had listed was a short history of money. So, and, you know, I, I sort of recommend actually Robert, I think Robert Rulo does the best job talking about this, if anyone I've heard. Uh, yeah, actually, if, if you really want a like 
first principles he did a series with um michael Saylor, where they they go like yeah. super in depth like we're talking back to when like the advent of the fire the little times yeah and yeah. like how energy has evolved over time and storing energy and um just how money came to be it, it really is a good discussion i could listen to michael Saylor, i think for like hours and hours <laughs> it's amazing how much that guy knows yeah he, um, he, he knows an incredible amount uh, yeah it's, it's insane um he's just so well read too i mean he was he was talking about i mean in that series he's talking about these very very sort of, of out there books that i i mean that i haven't heard a lot of people talk about and all these different topics i mean Sort of, sort of weird. He started talking about X Men at one point. Sort of really? weird for a, what, well, how, yeah, fifty or sixty year old man. Oh, oh, because you, a, I, I think, I think I remember when he brought that up. The super, he, he's talking about offensive superpowers versus defensive superpowers, defensive right? Defensive superpowers, right? Yeah. And he was saying, you know, you, you can you can be cool and shoot lasers out, but the the person that's just like indestructible is he's, always going to outlast right. all those other superpowers. Right, but he then said that the person that's the best is the person that's able to absorb, uh, yeah, absorb the superpowers. Which you know he sort of then quoted Taleb and referred to that as being anti-fragile. Which I, I think I would sort of agree with. Yeah. Okay. So the the purpose of money is first and foremost to act as a medium of exchange. So I, I think from a historical standpoint, we had bartering, right? Well, uh, you know. Okay, so. I actually thought it started out as bartering. I heard this other guy, Joe Brown, today say that that actually yeah, is I, incorrect. I, I heard that too. I don't believe that. I mean, how how on earth could you not have at some point had bartering? Well, he was saying that it was actually a credit system to begin with, and that you just say like, okay, I'll give you, you know, if if I need like, I don't know, a fish, um, and I have some meat. I, and you need meat today, I could give you meat and we could keep a tally of like what you owe me in the future. And it's kind of like a credit system. Um, I think you said the first recorded thing was a credit system, but mm -hmm. I feel like you have to in, sort of imagine that at some point there was just true bartering going on. Pro probably. I mean, that's intuitively, that's what I would think, I guess. Right. But uh, yeah, so it's a unit of account, and then I guess probably probably one of the most hotly debated uh, topics is it's a store of value, and exactly what is a store of value is probably uh, one of the more debated topics in the Bitcoin versus gold community of uh, what is the value. So I guess I would say I, I tend to lean to the more historical definition of what a store of value is, which is you're, you're storing the value of whatever the good is. So in essence of, I guess, gold is probably the most common one. So I'll just talk about gold. You're, you're storing the, the value of the properties of gold. So either if you want to use it for jewelry, or I mean, gold today is used in various different types of electronics, or you know even some drugs and medical supplies. When you have gold, you are storing that value that gold can be used for those goods. Um, so so the, the Bitcoin people community would say that Bitcoin is a store of value. Uh, that is hotly debated. Do you want to sort of explain why Bitcoin is a store of value, Jack? Um, well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, the, the people that kind of hate on Bitcoin or the, it, they kind of say there's like no intrinsic value. And I guess, I mean, I like gold. I also really like Bitcoin because I, I feel like I've seen the uses for Bitcoin and I feel like the intrinsic value is that it doesn't take up a lot of space and you can move it from country to country. Like I sent some Bitcoin to a friend's girlfriend that needed, to, that needed some money for English lessons in Thailand. And I was able to transfer her money, you know, on, on my phone. And if I needed to do that with gold, I would not, it, it's not as simple. It's not, it's gold is just more clunky. Um, 
And then, you know, I, I heard that Peter Schiff and what was the other guy's name? The debate Machinsky? recently. Did you, did you watch that? I, I watched some of it. Um, I mean, and, and Mashinsky was saying that they, they tried to sell tokenized gold, which is basically what Schiff says one could do. But at the end of the day, if you're not, if you're not holding the gold, that, that's the risk. The, the, the cool thing about Bitcoin is you can hold it yourself. Like you're not relying on anyone else. I mean, you could hold your own gold too, but if you then like, yeah, if, if like we were, I guess, you know, if we were Jews in Poland when the Nazis were around and we wanted to get, take our gold out, we probably would have been stopped. Our gold yeah. probably would have been cons- confiscated. <laughs> so, so I can, I can talk a little bit about this, but I, I know Schiff actually also offers, I've heard Schiff talk about how he also offers a similar service. Uh-huh. And he has, he has gold vaults. You know, I know at one point he was in Perth, uh, he mm-hmm. was in Perth in Switzerland where he had gold vaults stored so you could have a shift gold account and then you would have a debit card where you could use your debit card and it would just uh, it would literally just take away your gold. Mm-hmm. So but you could then lay claim to that. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Like, I, I, also I mean, at the end of the day, really- you need to you need to be trusting whoever's storing the gold or whatever you're right. Your, yeah, that is that is true. Yeah. So that is true. I guess that, I, I mean, that I, is. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I also I also think Bitcoin has value. And for the same reasons that you do, I, I think it is a there is a huge value to be able to transfer money anywhere in the world, 24, 7, 365 uh, and not have to go through any type of red tape, like using banks for anyone that's ever tried to transfer money like a wire transfer through a bank or just sending money through a bank is kind of a hassle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, you know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not extreme. I mean, I think that Mashinsky at one point said like, you know, gold has no value, like all these, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I he's, think, he's I think Saylor has said something similar too. Well, I, I mean, when they say that, I, I just get so frustrated when I say that. I, I don't understand how you can say that. Because uh, clearly gold, has, gold does have a value. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, people are going to be willing to pay something for that metal because it right. does have I, uses. I, mean, I, I don't know. It makes when I hear them say that, I to me it makes them sound very weak because they're just, you know, you have a great product, just stand on the morals of your product. You don't need to attack gold. Like gold clearly has value; it's been used for thousands of years. It's I don't think it's going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we would consider the U.S. dollar to be good medium of exchange and unit of account. But right now, it's maybe not so such a good store of value. Store of value. I, I think that's probably safe to say. And that's, yeah. But on the same token, Bitcoin and gold really are not a good uh, medium of exchange. Um, like, well, I mean, yeah, it would, yeah, I, I would say that. Um, well, he sort of uh, goes into, I guess, originally we went, we were on. I guess if you if you read the first appendix where he's talking about the history of money, he goes into uh-huh. how we were originally on a bimetallic uh, a bimetallic sy- system using you know gold uh, gold is like the true store of value, and then silver you would use silver coins for your day to day purchases. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that was I think more so how most societies were set up, where you would use a variety of different metals. I think the, the Roman denarii was actually based of silver, correct? Or do you remember that? That, that I don't remember. Okay. Uh, right. So, I mean, gold and silver have both sort of been used as store of values and as money throughout, throughout history. Uh, for, for U.S. history, it was usually viewed that gold was your true store of value and then silver, at least in like the 1800s around the Civil War time, and then silver was used for your day-to-day purchases. Uh, but it, he, he brings up, and I, I guess I'll just say this. So he, he brings up this interesting point about how almost every society in the world starts off being on some type of monetary system that is either fully used of metals or based on metals, and then slowly will shift to paper currencies uh, because the government finds that they're able to uh, expand the money supply, and then they get the benefits of inflation. 
but he, he brings up this, this point, and I'll just read this paragraph out of the book of fiat currencies. So fiat currency failure is the rule, not the exception. According to a study of 775 historical fiat currencies published on dollardays.org, there's there's no precedent for a fiat currency steadily holding its value ever. The study found that 20% failed through hyperinflation, 21% collapsed because of war, 12% were destroyed by independence. Of the rest, 24% were monetarily reformed, 23% are still in circulation, all but subject to a steadily declining value. On average, the life expectancy of those 775 currencies has been a mere 27 years. That's uh, you know, in some regards, I've I've heard that the the most successful currency of all time is the uh, English sterling. I think it was the English pound or English sterling dollar that has hmm. lasted like some three hundred and fifty years or something. Huh. But uh, I think the U.S. dollar is devalued close to ninety percent since nineteen seventy. Um, it's wow, kind of crazy if you think about it. That's only yeah. fifty years ago and. I mean, that's just wild. Yeah. I mean, it's like wild to think about because it's wild, in my opinion, it's wild to think about that going forward, knowing that, you know, every, you know, so if, if we go at the same rate in 50 years, every dollar we make today is worth, you know, 10 cents then, right? Dang. That doesn't sound very good. Um, Dang. Yeah. So buy real stuff and... I guess right. just just have a good time now because <laughs> like you might I, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's like bleak to think about. And the US is supposed to be like the cream of the crop. And we're we're still fiat. So well, well where do we go? <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, I mean I was I was talking like this is sort of I, I think we're sort of about to talk about how we became the reserve currency, but you know, every other uh, every other fiat currency is worse than the dollar, right? Right? Like, essentially, we are the best. We are the best fiat currency in the world. Would you agree with that? I mean, I, I guess, yeah. I mean, pe- people need us the most. It seems so. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess we are. We are the best fiat currency. We're the best house on a bad block. <laughs> that's, that's right. So, like everyone. <laughs> Yeah, everyone comes, everyone in the rest of the world, I, I think that just sort of creates an artificial demand for dollars, which keeps, yeah. I, I would say, the dollar artificially strong and allows the government sort of to abuse that by printing. But everyone, I mean, because I, I used to, well, I still, I now work with a different set of Indians, but I used to work with a good amount of Indians. And I, I always get confused if they're, I think they're ruples. And I think the Indian dollar is the ruble, not the ruby is the Russian dollar, I believe. But he, he told me when he was in India, everyone in India, as soon as they got a paycheck, they would go convert into dollars because hmm. the ruble would just, you know, it was so volatile, it would just collapse. Like it would just, it would be like just having all of your money almost in Bitcoin. You would never know. Except it's not going crazy, crazy high. I, you know, it would just like collapse near to zero. Hmm. And you want, you want whatever you're holding, and that's essentially what a store of value is. You want whatever you're holding the majority of your earnings in to be stable. You don't want huge variations in its worth. Yeah, because I mean, you think about the energy you put in to make that money originally. Like that's the whole. You want to like store the energy, the work effort that goes into making right. Yeah, that money. <laughs> right. It's like yeah. storing. I, I think of it almost as storing your like time labor. Yeah, it's like your life. Like it represents yeah. like moments of your life. Your life. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, the Indians, I think, have a, a very strong culture of also buying like a lot of jewelry, a lot of gold. Um, yeah. For, for that, for, for that, that reason, same reason. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, Schiff talks a lot about just buying like, you know, buying, a, uh, you know, gold, like gold jewelry, buying Rolexes, because, you know, if you buy a Rolex, that's, you know, I don't know how much a Rolex, like what, five to ten thousand dollars that you can just put on your wrist and you know, walk around. Uh, 
and those are have a pretty historical high store value. Uh, yeah. I feel like we've sort of touched base a good amount on, uh, on, on that topic. Is there anything else you wanted to add? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I think we're, well, what, what do you want to discuss next? Well, we have this, we have this next session written down for the formula Aristotle's formulation of ideal money. Do you want to uh, go into that maybe? Sure. Um, so we got durable, portable, divisible, and intrinsically valuable. Now, hopefully, um, so let's see here. So like, so when we talk about durability, it, it must not weather, rot, fall apart, or become unusable. It must be able to withstand the test of time, which is one reason barley fell out of favor. Um, um, and portable must be easily movable and hold a large amount of universal value relative to its size, eliminating herds of cattle. So that, that was like back in the day when things would be traded in cattle. <laughs> I mean, and also like barrels of oil, like it's, it's hard to, you know, transport oil. a yeah. barrel of oil, um, for, for divisible, should be relatively easy to separate and put back together uh, without ruining its basic characteristics. And, and I thought he, they, he, he gave a good example of uh, the, the Mona Lisa, because everyone considers the Mona Lisa very like valuable, but you, you can't really take it apart and put it back together and still maintain its original like beauty. Um, so it needs to be divisible and intrinsically val valuable, it should be valuable in and of itself. And its value should be totally independent of any other object. Essentially, the item must be rare. Thus, for example, packets of dirt just will not do. So that's, uh, and, and, and I know Breedlove, Breedlove goes through, he, he's got this speech like down pat because he, he talks about this a lot and how Bitcoin kind of checks yeah, a lot of these boxes. Well, he, he, goes, he goes through how gold used to be the best and now how Bitcoin is just better. Yeah. Uh, it, it, really, it, it really is a great speech that he gives. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I always find it interesting to listen to like hear about these things and think about it and talk about them of, you know, what makes, what makes it good and how things have been sort of replaced through time. Mm -hmm. it really, it really is quite interesting. That is. Yeah. Um, so I think we've sort of, uh, that was sort of some history of money and it's it sort of, I mean, he, uh, Katusa talks about that a lot in the book, but I, I really thought that what I took the most away from this was his chapters on, energy and then elements, I guess, slash commodities. Mm -hmm. And I guess you want to, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So sure. So energy to feel, so he, he goes a lot into, I guess, green energy and then a little bit into nuclear. Uh, so the green energy that he talks the most about, I would say would be sun and wind, right? I think so, and, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess I'll just sort of initially go over in one of the, when he talks about how, when you're doing valuations of these green energy companies, there's something he calls a BOE, which is a barrel of oil equivalent, and then a GBOE, which would be a green barrel of oil equivalent. So a barrel of oil equivalent would be the energy produced from a barrel of oil. So then a GBOE would be the energy produced uh, essentially the green energy produced from a renewable source, or you could think of it from, from a fusion or fission source that would be equivalent to a single barrel of oil. So to, to, really, uh, to really compare energy company to energy company, you have to be able to compare the energy output that they're both producing, right? Plus, and then, you know, their cost. So he does this interesting calculation and it's not really 
getting getting the units right isn't really that difficult, but he then goes into into some calculus. But so imagine you have a you know an oil company that produces a hundred barrels of oil a day. Right. So that gives out a, a given output of energy and a single, I just have this number written down uh, that, I mean, that he, he listed, but a barrel of energy, a barrel of oil, sorry, a barrel of oil equivalent is equal to 6.12 times 10 to the third megajoules. And that is, okay. that is a unit of energy. So that's the amount of energy given off. So if you have uh so what, what you have is that green energy, for some reason, is calculated in megawatts. So really what you need to do to be able to compare these things is you have to convert megawatts into megajoules. And that's not really that difficult. You have to go through a unit conversion. So you have to convert megawatts first into kilowatt hours, and then a kilowatt hour is equivalent to 3.65 megajoules. So okay. once you can get uh, your megawatts into kilowatt hours, you then convert that into megajoules, and then that will give you, you can then from there convert your megajoules into barrels of oil equivalent. So sort of the interesting part was, you know, let's say you have an oil company that produces a hundred barrels of oil a day, and you have some, you know, solar plant, or I think the example he gives in the book is a geothermal plant, and they produce, let's say, you know, I'm just making these numbers up, but they produce like 80 barrels of, you know, 80 GBOEs. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could then in theory say, well, the, you know, the oil is better, right? Because they're able to produce more. But if you look at it through, you know, the lens of time, uh, the part of it being renewable means that as you go through time, you know, the barrels of oil that are being produced through, uh, through the oil production will, you know, steadily go down, right? Like the oil well will eventually dry up where you could in theory say, you could make an argument that your GBOEs will go up because, you know, the technology to harness these natural resources will uh, earn these natural, like the sun or the wind, the efficiency of the, of that technology will go up. Battery storage will go up. Uh, I always heard, at least as of when I was in college, that the real problem in solar power wasn't the fact that uh, our panels weren't good enough to collect the energy, but it was that we weren't able to really store the energy that the battery efficiency was very low. And I think that is slowly been on the rise. And he, he talks a lot about batteries in the book and how the batteries are getting better. So you could then argue that as, as that technology becomes more and more efficient, you know, your, your green energy is going to become better and better and will slowly replace the oil. And I think he then sort of talks about how he envisions a lot of these green companies buying oil companies for present day cash flow, and then eventually transitioning all that cash flow into developing the technology for uh, the green energy. I, th I think a lot of that was kind of, he was saying that the government would kind of force uh, companies green or create an incentive structure for example, a, a dirtier type of energy, like if they wanted to take out debt, like they might have to borrow at a higher rate than a, a clean energy company. So there's a cost of capital advantage to the clean energy companies. And, um, but, but yeah, like the, the, a lot of the green energy would, um, buy up these older type of companies for cash flow early and slowly convert um, and, and use that cash flow to go towards green energy. So some of the like the batteries he was talking about I'd never heard of like I mean I never heard of like a water battery or yes. a liquid metal <laughs> battery. So the, the water battery, and I, I don't know if I'm, I, I was understanding this right, I, the water battery I thought was fascinating, and it sounded like you were using 
instead of having to store the energy, you were using the energy in real time to pump water up a gradient. And then when you wanted to use the energy, you would just allow the water to come down the gradient to turn a turbine. So you could envision if you have like solar panels as you're gener instead of having to store the energy from the solar panels, as you collect that energy, you have them pump water up like a hill. Uh -huh. And then when you want to release that energy, you have this, uh, if you, I don't know if you ever took physics, but from anyone, you know, you have potential energy stored and your gradient is gravity. And that when you just want to release the energy, you just allow the water to flow down the hill to turn a turbine. And then you have the energy from the turbine uh, being generated. Okay. Um, and then there was the, the absolutely bonkers idea of like shooting. And he said it would have to be like kilometers in diameter to like put a battery into space. And then basically that would collect I think energy from the sun and then it would be shot down to people in terms in like, like microwave form, S similar to how like those cordless uh, phone chargers work where you just set your phone on the battery and I guess the energy somehow flows to the phone. I mean, that was, that was kind of crazy. To yeah, think that, about. Was, that was, that was all well above my head. Yeah, I no idea what's going on, but I mean, that sounds like out of like some sci-fi, you know, book. <laughs> I mean, his section, he had, he had the section on, uh, I guess, fusion or nuclear power. And I think he talks about the uranium market a lot in uh, one of the appendixes. Mm -hmm. But that was just ungodly confusing. Like all the interplay... He had this incredible amount of interplay of these Russian companies uh, and how we as a country want to get rid of and get away from essentially relying on Russian uranium. Uh, and, and to a lesser extent, I guess, Kazakhstan, I guess Kazakhstan has like 40% of the uranium, but they have to have it refined in Russia. Hmm. And how we, he was saying it's essentially a, 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 uh, a national security to try and get away from relying on their uranium uh, in case we, if, so we can go into, if we need nuclear power. But one of the key things that I, I really looked up after reading this book, I started listening to all these TED talks on, I guess, renewable energy and then uh, I guess nuclear energy. And, and I heard these people talking about thorium power plants, which I had never heard of until this. And thorium, I guess, would be a suitable replacement for uranium power, uh, uranium uh, fission power plants, except uh, thorium results in, I think, like a hundredth of the waste. The half-life is, you know, a tenth. There's way, it's way more abundant. You can find thorium in literally every, you know, every part of dirt in the world. The only problem is that it's not highly concentrated. So you would have to be mining over a huge area mm -hmm. and you can't, there, there's a greater abundance. So a greater abundance of visible material. So I guess when you mine uh, uranium, it has to be highly refined to get the fission reactions to go. Uh, that's not a problem with thorium. I think the visible material of thorium was close to like 95% or something. Don't, that number may be, I think it's relatively close to being correct, not totally. Uh, but, and also you can't, I guess you can't weaponize the thorium. You can't make like a nuclear bomb out of this. Um, and I guess, yeah, I, I just was, I was shocked that I one, had never heard of this stuff. And two, that we weren't, there wasn't a higher push to get it going because it is, you know, it, um, uh, the nuclear power plants, you know, are very, unless in, uh, unless in a, you know, a dire, uh, a, you know, a catastrophe, they are very clean. They don't really have any emissions. So they are good for the environment. 
It's just in a very, very rare scenario, you result in a very, uh, you can have a very bad result. But thorium sort of has all of the benefits and it reduces a lot of the negatives. It just seems like the problem would be the startup cost. Yeah, setting it all up. Going. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that, or any of any of this? Not, um, no, I think you did a. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of this science stuff is uh, over my head. <laughs> Sorry, but but yeah, it sounded like thorium. Yeah, I, it, from what I yeah from what I could take it, it seemed like it's just the the infrastructure is there for the uranium where it's not for the thorium, and they it it was set up for uranium because we needed it for the bomb, um, right? And that's why it exists for uranium but doesn't for thorium. So, I guess we haven't. I don't know if. We haven't really touched on the carbon credits at all. I don't know if we want to touch on that or. Um, yeah, you want to give a, can you give a brief breakdown of what those are? And so I'm, I mean, I'm obviously still uh, looking into a lot of this and I, I've heard Marin speak, but it sounds like during this transition to green energy, a lot of these dirtier, I guess I'd call them dirtier, but like a lot of the old school energy companies are going to basically be penalized because they're not as green and they'll have the option to buy these carbon credits to offset some of these negative aspects of their business. And, and it sounds like, don't don't quote me on this, but like, like some of these oil companies might have to like take a haircut from their assets. So like, let's say they think their assets are, I don't know, we'll, we'll just a hundred billion dollars or something. They might have to take a 20% haircut because they are not super green. So instead of writing hundred million or a hundred billion in assets, that they'll only be able to say they have 80 billion in assets. And to offset this penalty, they will be allowed to buy these carbon credits um, that are projects to add benefits to the environment. And it sounds like Katusa, I don't think he actually mentioned them in the book, but I, on, the, on his talks, he's talked about the three carbon credits. It's like green, blue, and white. The, the blue carbon credits have to do with projects that help the marine life and things dealing with the water green would be like forest and land and then white would be air think like airlines and that type of stuff but it to me it sounds like if you wanted to start up a carbon credit project you could go out create some benefit to society get it verified by this agency and then they would give you, and I think one carbon credit is basically a ton of carbon emissions. So you could get you could get verified that okay, this project you've done, you know, is worth I don't know a hundred carbon credits. And then you could go out into the market and sell these carbon credits to like the shells and the those types of companies, um, so, so that they they can have. Um, I mean, and the projects could be as simple as we're going to go replace all of the lights in, in America with these new energy efficient lights or something. And you could get that, that project verified. And then you could have companies come buy those carbon credits that you've just created. Now, that's kind of how I, I viewed it. And um, I, I don't know if you had any, any thoughts. I, yeah, I, I was I was very... I thought he would touch more about the carbon credits in the book. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought the carbon credits were just essentially projects to clean up the environment. I, I think you did a good job explaining it. Like the blue carbon credits would be like just cleaning up the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, because yeah. he actually, he, he has talked, he didn't talk about it in the book, but he talks about, um, I think it's squid, uh, not squid, um, maybe crab farming, like, like the Chinese are destroying a lot of these, what did he call them? Um, but, but basically these things underwater that are throwing off oxygen. And he was saying that it, um, I don't know if, I don't think they produce more than the rainforest, but in terms of oxygen production, it, it might be close. I, I, I was surprised. I hadn't heard of this, but like algae or it was some sort of, yeah, something under the water that th threw off a ton of oxygen. I, I was surprised. Um, and that, that would fall under the blue carbon credit, but, um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And he, he does say, uh, on, on the Kiyosaki interview, the latest one, he did say that there's a company called carbon streaming corp that is going to, if it's not already publicly traded, it will be publicly traded. So if you wanted to play this carbon credit game this way, you could do that. And for more research, you go to carboncredits.com. And he, I mean, he's kind of touting these carbon credits as like they are Bitcoin in like 2010. Like that's how early of a stage we are. And he, he thinks it, it sounds like a lot of countries are kind of already creating or making it law and kind of pricing these carbon credits uh, much higher than their value today, I guess. I, but yeah, de definitely a lot to look into on this uh, concept. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's a, it's an interesting concept. And I think he touts it as like, I mean, some absurd percentage of returns, which he expects. I mean, but yeah. who, I mean, who knows if that's accurate or whatever, but he's obviously very, he's a very successful investor. So yeah. Billionaire. Yeah. So the trace, you know, in, in the words of, uh, oh man, I'm forgetting. He's part of the trace Comas club. Uh, <laughs> well, what's What's that? Three commas. He's got the three <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I've never heard that. <laughs> Trace Comas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, I guess, are, I mean, are you going to be looking into the carbon credits at all? Like, what, what are you going to do, I guess? To... I mean, yeah, I, 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 think I, I think I will look into it just to, I mean, just to look into it enough maybe to just get some some exposure into it, maybe a small percentage of my uh, my net worth, maybe like 1% trying to go into this just because, I mean, if, you know, if what he's saying is true, then, you know, having some exposure even at 1% would be a, a very, very good uh, investment. Mm -hmm. uh, what about yourself? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably try to, I haven't gone on that carboncredits.com at all, but I'll probably try to kick around and try to do some research. And I, I mean, it sounds like you got a lot from the appendices. So I'll, I'll probably try to read the appendices to try to go through some of the math he provides just, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Any uh, closing thoughts? Uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the book. It was, it was, I'm sorry, it was a little, a little longer than what we normally read, but I, I think it was worth it. Uh, yeah, I think it was a good read. I, I, got, I felt like I got a lot of value from it. Uh, I highly recommend it. What about yourself? Uh, you know, it definitely opened up my eyes to a lot of the new technologies that are coming and like the thoughts of, I mean, even just trying to envision like a battery hovering in space and then shooting electricity yeah. down to us. It's kind of crazy and kind of, I mean, COVID also has like made us, I think all like reevaluate like dependencies on other countries and thinking about how to be more robust and independent 
Um, he did bring up Scotland was actually energy independent, which I didn't really think about or hadn't really thought of them as being like able to like survive on their own, but that's kind of cool. Like, I guess if I were thinking of good countries to like look at or invest in, like m- maybe I will think of more countries that are uh, just like totally like self-sufficient. And I mean, he, he said the U.S. electricity costs are like the lowest of any um, country, I think. So that that's kind of encouraging and that we, we have a lot of the infrastructure that he, he thinks it's only going to get better. Um, and yeah, I, I, I guess I, it was good. I, I was just going to say it was it was nice. To, like, I feel like it, when you read the news, I just or listen to think, listen to the podcast, I just always hear all these very you know, negative outlooks on America, like, you know, America used to be great, and we're going downhill, and China's going to overtake us, and it was, it was nice to hear someone talk about how they thought, uh, you know, America was just going to get stronger, Uh, so I thought, you know, even if he's wrong, it it was nice to read and hear a positive outlook on the country, uh, which seems to be few and far between uh, these days. Yeah, I guess, like when they when they kind of like criticize China, um, I don't know. Like I kind of, I kind of have like mixed feelings because like I feel like a lot of the stuff we're doing is kind of going towards what they are. So I I kind of I don't know. I have like I'm like torn a little bit. Like I don't know. It's just because uh, this MMT talk. I I don't know how. It, I, I just. I don't know how comfortable I feel about it or <laughs> like, I, I just can't get my head around still like how, how that world is going to look and if people will really get behind that and like other countries will kind of just, I don't know, allow the U S to kind of do what they want to that extent. I don't know. I mean, well, what was what was really scary was that TIP episode where the guy was talking about the the one that you talked about earlier. He was talking about the CBDCs, and I mean, I, I thought that was terrifying. Listening to him talk about getting those central bank digital currencies and making all the citizens use them, and how the government would essentially be able to it, it, it would just be able to control everyone almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think I sort of, I, I think I get where you're coming from. Yeah. But it'll be uh, these next couple of decades, I guess, while we transition to these more energy efficient ways, it, it will be interesting. And yeah, maybe we can hop on this carbon credit bandwagon. Ride it, ride it to the moon, hopefully. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, so I think, I think. With that said, uh, please reach out to us at brothersonbooks at gmail.com for any book recommendations, or if you would like to be a guest host for a particular book you have in mind, a great review or rating on whichever platform you're listening to would be greatly appreciated. And lastly, if you can think of any friend, family member, or coworker that might like this episode, please pass it along. I'm Alex Allwile, and with me as always is my brother Jack Allwile. Jack, it's been a pleasure today. Uh, What is the next book we're doing? So this is kind of cool because when I was at FinCon a few months ago in Austin, Texas, uh, we had a Facebook group for authors there. And this guy, Jason Brown, uh, reached out to me and thought it would be fun to discuss his book on our podcast. And I, yeah, we, we agreed. And his book is called It Is Possible, How I Earned Two Debt-Free Degrees and how you can too. And I mean, the, the student debt crisis, I think it's like 1.7 trillion um, right now on the, the balance sheet of <laughs> student loan debt. So it's definitely a big issue and affects affecting, uh, I think it was like 45 million people in America. So it's definitely a big issue. And we're going to talk to Jason about this. Yeah, it should be should be good. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, should be good. Okay, Al. All right. It's been a pleasure. Yep.